Shalom, my name is Joseph Shulam, and in partnership with Brad TV, we are doing the Torah portions that are being read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And this next Sabbath, the portion is called Balak. Starts from Numbers chapter 22, verse 2, and ends in chapter 25, verse 9. The parallel reading from the prophets is from Micah chapter 5, verse 7, to chapter 6, verse 8. And from the New Testament, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 to verse 23. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, in all these places, Balak, the king of Moab, is mentioned. And of course, Balak, the king of Moab, is mentioned in connection with Balaam the international soothsayer, the international prophet that is invited by Balak, the king of Moab, to come and curse Israel, put a spell on Israel. The reason that he wants to put a spell on Israel is because he's afraid. Israel has been wandering in the Sinai desert for 40 years, Big and formidable enemies like the Amalekites wage war against Israel. The Israelis are a bunch of slaves that has been freed from Egyptian slavery. They have been slaves. The Israelites have been slaves in Egypt for nearly 200 years. And so there, there are several generations, four or five generations of people that were born slaves in Egypt in hard labor. And after Joseph's death, several pharaohs later, the pharaoh that arises that doesn't know the story of Joseph and sees these slaves growing and multiplying, he gets scared. And in the end, with 10 plagues from God on Egypt, he releases them and we have the Passover story. And they're in the wilderness now for years. 40 years total, and they're approaching the land of Canaan. They have a battle with the king of Arad, which was one of the big cities in the northern Negev desert, a city that is, at that time, was already a couple of thousand years old when the children of Israel came and had war with the king of Arad. Now they're crossed on the other side of the Dead Sea into the land of Moab, and... Balak, the son of Zippor, sees them approaching his land and he dreads it. The children of Israel are so many. And he says that they are like the ox that eats up the grass of the field and leaves nothing behind him. And he decides, how am I going to deal with these Israelites? They're winning every war. Of course, they, he doesn't know that they're winning the war not because of their, their strength and their abilities. They're winning the war because God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, is on their side. And he delivers the Amalekites and other enemies into their hands, miraculously, supernaturally, if you wish. So he decides to Deal with it also with what he would consider a supernatural power. He invites an international soothsayer, an international magician, an international prophet, we would say false prophet, but a very capable prophet that has great international reputation. And he invites Balaam, the son of Beor, from the land of Mesopotamia, of the river, great rivers. And uh, Balaam is offered a, a, a lot of wealth for coming down to curse the children of Israel. Now the fascinating thing about this story is that Balaam, that Gentile false prophet, has abilities has a reputation, an international reputation, has a record of success in his profession, in his ministry, as a soothsayer, as a prophet. 
as somebody who can call supernatural powers to participate in whatever curse he applies on, on people and nations and kings. So Balak, the king of Moab, invites Balaam. Balaam gets on his donkey and he, uh, on the way to Moab from Mesopotamia, from Iraq of today, he comes to what is Jordan today, the country of Jordan. First, Balaam refuses to come. He refuses to come for several reasons. One of the reasons that he refuses to come, he wants more pay. He wants more wealth to come to his side. He's not happy with what Balak, the king of Moab, offers him. But finally, they come to an agreement, and Balaam gets on his donkey, and he... Uh, is hearing that Balak, the king of Moab, is going to give him a house full of silver and gold and beyond words. So he, he, he agrees with the price and he gets on his donkey and he saddles his donkey and he starts going down toward Moab. Quite a journey, by the way, several hundred miles. God is angry at Bil'am, Balaam. And he sends an angel, the angel of the Lord, and he stands in the way of Balaam and his donkey. The donkey sees the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey doesn't want to go forward. He starts turning aside. He starts to avoid the angel. Bilam gets angry at the donkey. He starts beating the donkey. Bilam doesn't see the angel. The donkey sees the angel. Bilam thinks that the donkey is just being stubborn, disobedient, unwilling to cooperate. But the donkey sees the angel and tries to avoid confrontation with the angel. And he's uh, being led by Bil'am. Bil'am has a stick and Bil'am hits the donkey because the donkey doesn't want to go forward. Finally, the donkey goes against the, the rock, against the cliff and squeezes Bil'am's leg against the wall trying to get his attention. And Bil'am, boom, boom, hits the donkey on the head with a stick. Finally, the donkey talks in human language to this Gentile, idolatrous prophet called Bil'am. And says, why are you beating me? Well, why, why are you st striking me three times? And Bil'am answered the donkey, because you have abused me. I wish there were a sword in my hand and now I would kill you. Bil'am threatens the donkey. The donkey answers Bil'am and says, listen, am I not your donkey? Have I not served you all these years that you've been riding on top of me uh, uh, faithfully? And now what is it? What is it? You know, why can't you understand what's happening in front of you? And only then the Lord, verse chapter 22 of Numbers, chapter, verse 31, the Lord opens Bilam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face in front of the angel of the Lord. Now this, this story of the donkey talking is an interesting story. And uh, you could take it any way you want to. I take the word of God literally in this case because God can talk 
through the wall. He can talk through the wind. He can talk through the storm. He can reveal himself in any way that he wants. In this case, Bil'am, the famous international prophet, for profit, doesn't see what the animal sees. He doesn't see what the donkey sees. He doesn't hear what the donkey hears. I think that is a great message there for today. Why am I saying that? That is a great message for today. Because today you've got 10 false prophets for a dime. A penny a false prophet. And, and most of them are pastors and Christian leaders and, and, and television stars that claim to be apostles patriarchs, prophets, whatever you want. But here you have a situation where the donkey has better insight on the things of the Lord than the famous international prophet Bil'am. Now, the interesting thing is that this false prophet Bil'am does communicate from God and does hear from God. And, and it does take an oath to do only what God wants him to do. He, he wants two things. He wants the gold and the silver that Balak, king of Moab, offered him. At the same time, he wants to do God's will. So how is he going to do it? So in the end what happens is because he wants both things he does go down to Balak and uh, agrees to go and, and talk about Israel and he says some of the, some of the most famous prayer opening in the Jewish world. Every synagogue service around the world starts with the words of this Gentile prophet, Bil'am, the son of Beor, coming from Mesopotamia. He comes to curse Israel and it turns out that he blesses Israel and, and, and the synagogue service in all the world on every holiday, on every Sabbath starts with the words, how wonderful are your tents, O Jacob. Your dwelling places, O Israel. A quotation from Balaam, the son of Beor. Ma tovu o alecha Israel, mishkenotecha Yaakov. Ah, how wonderful are your dwelling places, Israel. Your tents or Jacob. That's how the prayer services start in every synagogue, on every holiday, on every Sabbath day. Yes, Bil'am becomes one of the great villains of the Bible. It's mentioned all the way many, many times in the book of Numbers, beginning of chapter 22, almost to the end of the book of Numbers, is mentioned in the book of Joshua, is mentioned in the book of Micah, is mentioned in the book of Revelation. We'll go to Revelation and see uh, how Bil'am is mentioned and Balak is mentioned, the king of Moab, trying to uh, harm the children of Israel, stop the children of Israel from inheriting their rightful inheritance that was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, our forefathers. But the key port of this text that we call Balak is that all the means that human beings, anti-Semites, anti-Israelites, 
want to use to destroy Israel work and backfire at those who want to destroy Israel and to erase the Jewish people, the people of Israel, off the map of the world. Now, the only nation that I know in history that repeatedly throughout history there have been attempts to delete them, to cut their existence by big empires, is the, the, the small nation of the Jewish people, folks. We have in the Bible more than one attempt. This is one attempt by the king of Moab, Balak, that invites Bil'am to delete Israel by cursing them. Then you've got Haman in the book of Esther that proposes to Artaxerxes, the emperor of the Persian Empire, great Persian Empire, that ruled all of South Asia, all the way to Kazakhstan, all the stands, Persia, Azerbaijan, Pakistan, Northern India, Kazakhstan, Biribijan, all these southern um, uh, so former Soviet Union states were ruled by, by Artaxerxes. And he attacked Greece. He lost the Battle of Salamis in Greece with his armada ships. That same Artaxerxes is convinced by his prime minister, by second in command Haman, to write a letter to destroy, delete the Jewish people from the empire. Delete the Jewish people. Didn't work. In, in our own day, my parents are survivors of the Holocaust. Hitler decided to delete the Jewish people. The Catholic Church during the Inquisition in Europe decided to delete the Jewish people by forced converting them to Catholicism. Didn't work. And in this case, the donkey of Balaam was smarter and a greater prophet than Balaam himself. It didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because God has chosen the Jewish people to bring salvation to the world through his son, a Jew, the king of the Jews, Yeshua, Jesus. And anybody who turns against Israel in the end pays the price. We pay the price too because of our disobedience. We have suffered a diaspora of 2,000 years. God promised he would, if we go against him and harden our heart against him, the land will vomit us out. And it did. There were almost no Jews here for nearly 2,000 years in this land. There were the Romans and the Byzantines and the Arabs and the Persians. And finally, the, 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 the British... But finally, God kept his promise to the people of Israel. And the resurrection of the nation of Israel, a 20th century phenomena, the return of the Jewish people is still returning. It's not over. We're in the middle of the resurrection of the Jewish people. And, and we are going to see the fulfillment of all of God's promises to Israel, including the promise which was made by Isaiah, by Amos, by Zechariah, and by other of the prophets, and by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and verse 26. He says, Thus all Israel shall be saved in the end of the time of the fullness of the Gentiles, which is taken, a verse taken from Luke chapter 21, verse 24. 
describing what does it mean, the fullness of the time of the Gentiles. It means when Jerusalem will re return to be ruled by Israel, by the Jewish people. And this happened in 1967. Since 1967, dear brothers and sisters, the number of Jewish believers in Israel multiplied by thousands of percents. And not only in Israel, around the world. God is keeping His promises and every Christian in the world that wants to be on God's side needs to be on Israel's side if he wants the blessing that God gave to Israel. May God bless all of you and keep reading the Bible. In the name of our Lord Yeshua, keep reading the Bible. Open your mind. Read for yourself and pray for the Holy Spirit to quicken His Word to you. God bless you. Until the next Shabbat, we'll continue reading the Bible and go to the portion called Pinchas. Opinias, the way it's pronounced in English. Shalom from Jerusalem and blessing. Amen. Mm -hmm.